Hey you guys, Matt Allen here. Welcome back to Tactical Bassin. Today we're talking fishing rods. From beginner to advanced, from how to choose the right fishing rod for you, all the way up to what different actions and powers and the codes that are printed on rods mean and how you can apply that to your fishing. Let's go. The rods themselves are one of the most complicated parts of bass fishing. I've walked into so many tackle shops and seen that guy standing over by the rod racks, just glazed over. He's looking at rows of rods and just doesn't know what to do. I've been that guy. Uh, it's incredibly overwhelming to just stand back and see all those rods and know that they're for different things, but have no way to know the difference. So today we're going to start out with the beginner guy. I've got just some quick tips for the beginner. And in the video description of this video, that's going to be extremely helpful for you. I'll link a couple beginner, like a beginner bait caster and a beginner spinning rod. Uh, and then from there, we'll branch out into some very specific things for the more advanced guy. So again, this video will start out with some stuff for the beginner guy. Then I wanna talk to the budget guy because beginner and budget are not always the same thing. There are beginner guys that are willing to spend. Uh, there are very advanced guys that are on a budget. So we'll talk budget. Then we're going to head into the really advanced stuff. Start talking rod actions rod powers, rod lengths, looking at the code on all sorts. These are all different brands of rods that I brought with me. We're going to look at the codes so that you can walk into a tackle shop and interpret what you're looking at without taking that rod out to the lake and fishing with it. So back to the beginner guy. Right off the bat, you've got bait casters and spinning rods. The most basic thing I can say about that is that for the average angler, spinning rods are easier to start out with. Bait casters are a little more advanced. If you're throwing lighter baits, now this is just general reference. There are exceptions to all of the things I'm about to say, but generally speaking, spinning rods are much easier at throwing lightweight things, drop shots, Ned rigs, small weightless baits, things of that nature. Whereas bait casters are far more accurate and tend to be more powerful. So things like jigs, Texas rigs, crankbaits, topwaters, frogging, flipping, power fishing, you're typically better with a bait caster. So very simple there. As far as choosing a model for the beginner guy, the best thing I could say is that if you want a spinning rod, if you're going to spend the bulk of your time throwing smaller baits on lighter line, go with a spinning rod. The easiest thing to do is walk into a shop or get online, get on Tackle Warehouse and look for a spinning rod somewhere around the seven foot medium. If you're just going to get one, that's your rod because it can do almost anything. Now, if you tend to uh, have more junk in the water, more grass, more debris, or you tend to throw some different things, jigs, bigger worms, a variety of baits, then a bait caster. Focus your, ten your attention around a seven foot to a seven three medium heavy. And again, I'll link one of each of those in the description for you. Uh, something that's a little more budget friendly. Now you will find with me, when I say budget friendly, that typically starts at about 70 bucks and goes to about 120, 130. I understand that that's not budget for a lot of people. The reason why that's the cutoff that we use is because as you spend money on fishing gear, there are these huge leaps in quality that take place, huge leaps. If a guy wants to spend 20, 30 bucks on a rod, I completely understand, but I don't think that I can lend a whole lot of value to helping you choose one that's significantly better than another. 
it used to be the hundred dollar line in the sand. If you spent more than a hundred dollars, they were way better than if you spent less than a hundred dollars. But these companies have put a lot of money in recent years into that 70 to hundred dollar rod. So now I would say 70 to 120, 130, you get amazing rods that are light years above some of that more budget oriented stuff. And then again, when you spend more beyond that, you see huge leaps in progress in those rods. So for the beginner guy, keep it super simple. Spinning rod, a bait caster, you can do most things with just that. For the budget guy, for the guy that wants to spend less money, the best tip I can give you is to buy rods that are a little bit longer. And we've talked about this in some videos, but I'm gonna show you this trick again because this makes all the difference. Now, this one's got fluorocarbon on it. The first thing that a budget guy can do is switch over and put braid on a reel. If you had, I didn't have one just sitting here with braid on it, but if you have braid on a reel, your sensitivity goes way up. So braid, the line itself is incredibly sensitive. So even on a rod that is less sensitive, you will feel more. So that's the first thing that you can do to take a budget rod or a budget combo and step it up in sensitivity. The second thing you can do is buy that longer rod. The reason why I say that is that if you take a rod, we're going to talk about something called deflection. And I want you to understand this. When you pull on the line, when that rod starts to give, the rod is deflecting, okay? That is going to be extremely important for the budget angler. Not necessarily the beginner angler, the budget angler. Here's why. Watching for deflection can make up for an incredible lack in sensitivity. What I mean by that is I can go fishing with a $20 combo and I can see bites in the rod even if I can't feel them coming through the rod because it's not sensitive enough. So there are huge advantages to spending more money on more sensitive rods, but if you're just trying to get by, you buy a little bit longer. For a spinning rod, minimum seven foot, uh, seven one, seven three, seven six, if you can find it. Those longer rods, the reason why is the longer they are, that tip section tends to be thinner for longer and you'll just see the deflection more clearly. So here's why this matters. Let's say I've got a drop shot tied on and I throw it out there and I'm pulling it across the bottom. It doesn't matter what the bait is, a drop shot, a jig, I don't care whatever you want to imagine you've got tied on, when you start pulling it across the bottom, you're going to see that rod deflecting as it's bouncing over rocks or catching on wood or moving its way across gravel. You'll see that rod deflecting. Well, what is amazing and what most people don't realize is that even if you're throwing an eighth of an ounce, that deflection is very defined you can figure out that an eighth of an ounce looks like that in your rod tip. A quarter ounce might look like that. A half ounce might look like that as you're pulling it across the bottom. Once you've identified what your bait looks like in the rod, see I'm just bouncing an eighth of an ounce off of some rocks, all of a sudden when I see this, either I've hung it up or I've been bit. It's one or the other because it's pulled more than the bait itself can pull. So as soon as I see that, I start to lean back on that rod. If it feels like I'm snagged, okay. But if it feels like something else, I hit them. By tip watching for deflection, I can literally see fish eat my bait faster than I can feel them in a rod that lacks sensitivity. So again, for the beginner guy or for the budget guy, paying attention to rod deflection and using braided line will take your game to the next level. Now, for the guy who's been fishing for a while or you're stepping into more advanced gear. Maybe you've done this your entire life, but you don't really understand the codes and you know that you own the same 
similar action rod from two different brands and they don't seem the same at all. What is the deal? It could not have been designed to be more confusing, but I'm going to help you make heads, heads or tails of it really quickly here. Uh, and then you'll be able to walk into shops, pick up rods, feel them and have a really strong understanding of those rods without ever having to take them out on the water. This came about for Tim and I because we're constantly trying new gear, constantly. As a result, we own more than 30 brands of rods, quite a bit more than 30 actually. We own a pile of brands of rods because we try to try everything. We want to be as fair as possible. So we're constantly picking up new models, new brands, or a familiar brand comes out with a new line, we try that because we want to be able to answer people's questions as fairly as possible. We knew that that was needed in bass fishing. Nobody was doing that, still to this day, nobody does that because it takes an insane amount of money to buy all that gear and an insane amount of time to run it all through the paces and get a feel for it. But Tim and I are just insane enough. Our inner tackle junkies are just crazy enough that we have taken that project on over the last 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, so as a result, we have an incredible grip on different actions, powers, models, brands, all the way across the board. So the first thing I wanna talk about is action and power and how that applies to your fishing. Okay, power is simple. Power is just how much force does it take for that rod to flex? Okay, so you've got medium light, light, mediums, medium heavies, heavies, extra heavies, right? All the way down to ultra lights on the other end. That part is simple. That's just how much force does it take? Are you drop shotting? You're probably using a light, a medium light. Are you flipping super heavy cover? You're using an extra heavy. Brogan, extra heavy. Where it gets interesting is where you start to add in action because this is where it gets confusing for people. We'll get so many comments from somebody that's like, hey, can I use this whatever, seven, six heavy crankbait rod to throw a swim bait. And we're like, no, absolutely not. And they're like, it's a seven, six heavy. I see it's rated to an ounce and a half. My swim bait's only an ounce and a quarter. Why can't I do it? Well, that particular rod is moderate. It can't set that hook. Even though it's rated heavy enough to do it, it cannot do it. So understanding where action and power come together, that's everything. So let's talk action. Okay, this rod is actually a moderate. That's why I grabbed it because you can't fake it on a rod that's any faster than that. So let's start out. We just talked about rod deflection. Okay, action is going to be how much of the rod wants to flex. So an extra fast rod just the first part of that tip section will flex, okay? Extra fast. Fast. Moderate fast. True moderate. And then you can even go beyond that. But in the US market, you really don't go beyond that. You got extra fast, fast, moderate fast, moderate. It's how much of the rod is deflecting under load. So power is how much force does it take to bend it. Action is how much of that rod is involved in that bend. So a truly moderate rod, or you could go farther than that. They make slow action rods, but we just don't even see those in bass fishing where they come right out of the handle and it's like, it's like parabolic, right? It bends right over. Those are slow, but most of bass fishing revolves around moderate, moderate, fast, fast, extra fast. Super sensitive rods, the materials that they're made out of tend to be 
extra fast or fast. Uh, really budget oriented materials, they just tend to be very moderate to moderate fast. Uh, that's why a guy can save a ton of money. So let's take a bait like a crankbait, basically anything with a treble hook. Okay, a crankbait or a topwater, anything with a treble, you want a more moderate action. So you want a rod that will load deep into the blank. You really want that rod to load up when you have a fish on it. And the reason why is that the bait itself might be large. Now this one isn't, but the bait itself, let me get that out of my arm, might be large. But when you hook a fish on it, the hook points themselves are very small. So a more moderate rod, a rod that will load deeper into the blank will absorb more as a fish is pulling or head shaking or thrashing. It absorbs all of that force much better than a rod that is not moderate, that's fast or extra fast. So anything with a treble hook, lean to the moderate, okay? Now, power, because there are medium moderate rods, there are heavy moderate rods, there are extra heavy moderate rods. That's because you can get treble hooks on a little tiny square bill, you can get treble hooks on a 10XD, you can get treble hooks on a giant glide bait. So the power has to do with how big and how heavy that bait is, but that action, they're all moderates. That's to help that rod fold up and absorb when those fish are pulling or thrashing, jumping, head shaking. So again, more moderate for all of your treble hooks. What I started to say is that that's a huge benefit for the guy on a budget because budget materials by nature tend to be more moderate. So you can save a ton of money. You don't have to have a five or six or $700 crankbait rod. Now you may want sensitivity to go with that moderate. Uh, so as a result, you may spend a bunch more. Uh, I use a lot of these IMX pros for my cranking. I use a bunch of different models from a bunch of different companies, but the majority of my crankbait rods are IMX Pros. They're like mid $300. Uh, that's because for me, the very specific models, different lengths, uh, really help me dial in specific baits. Because again, a 10XD, a 6XD, and a Zuma, uh, a Mega Bass Deep Six, our Tactical DD75, a lipless crankbait, a square bill, if you're really dialing it in, those need different rods. They're very different baits with very different size hooks. Uh, so I'm able to dial it in through a line of rods. Uh, but for the guy who's just coming in on a budget, you can save a ton of money. You can go buy a $79 to $99 rod that's naturally very moderate, and that rod will get you through most situation. So again, in the video description, I'm going to break out a huge list. We're limited on space down there. I can only give you so many, but we'll take a bunch of the popular techniques. Jig, crankbait, flipping, punching, frogging. I don't know. We'll, we'll take a bunch of those and I'll give you Tim and I's specific favorite model for everyone. And then I'll also below that give you a section of uh, more budget minded rods, not necessarily beginner rods, just budget minded rods that will help save you some money and still work really well for a bunch of those different techniques. Just to give you a baseline and a head start, you may want to take that and apply it to a different brand. We're going to jump into brands in a second, but I wanted you to understand the differences between action and power and how that impacts you. So we talked about treble hook baits leaning to the very moderate end of things. Uh, things like a drop shot, a Ned rig, really finessey stuff. Now, I didn't rig one up. I don't think I even brought one. I don't have one sitting here, but a really sensitive spinning rod, they tend to either be fast or extra fast. Only the tip section's going to load. The rest of that rod stays pretty straight unless you really get a big one and she's bulldogging, and then you'll see it come down into the mid. The reason for that is one, the material they're made out of, extremely sensitive. 
it's going to naturally be extra fast. So just the tip of that rod's going to deflect. The benefit of that in your fishing is that you've got insane sensitivity as you're working, say, a drop shot. As soon as I feel something, I'm able to just lean back. That's all I have to do. And I take my little drop shot hook and that thing just digs in on its own. And just the tip of that rod loads up and gives me that quick little snap hook set. And I've got that thing buried. And then the fish just fight on the tip of that rod really well. Again, unless all of a sudden I realize I've got a five or six pound smallmouth on it, she starts to bulldog. And then you'll see it start flexing more towards the mid of that rod. Um, jig rods are another one of the rods where I'm really specific. Uh, most things, I just like a fast action rod, you know, Texas rigging, most applications, but I'm very specific with a jig. The reason why is that a jig is a lot of weight right in the front of a fish's face. When you stick them on a jig, you almost always pin them in the roof of the mouth and the weight is either right at the front of the mouth or it's outside the mouth. And a lot of jigs are heavy, half, three quarter ounce. Jigs are notorious for fish coming up and thrashing and throwing them. The industry for a long time went to fast and extra fast jig rods. And from the day that began, I preached against it. I do not want an extra fast jig rod. I want moderate fast. I, my favorite jig rod of all time for all around jig, Mega Bass, the Orochi Brailist. This is the Orochi EMTF. That's my favorite heavy football jig rod. Uh, those two Mega Basses are just phenomenal. Now the rating on the rod doesn't necessarily match me calling it a moderate fast, but I'm telling you when you get on the water with it and you watch its behavior, it acts like a moderate fast and it's perfect for that. Uh, another example, G Loomis. Do I have an MBR? I do. 844 MBR. My main football jig rod. 3 8 half ounce footballs. I do so many things with an 844 MBR it's out of this world. This is one of those rods that has a unique action. It's more of a moderate fast, plus it just has an amazing tip section. I'm able to do everything from throw a football jig to a spinnerbait to a Texas rig. I mean, almost you name it, top water, all on the same rod uh, because it's a very unique action. That's what you get when you start spending more money with some of these brands. You get into very specific things, which in a lot of situations creates like the perfect football jig rod, the perfect blade bait rod, right? And a guy will spend a ton of money for a rod that he'll use for one thing. But there are also rods like these MBRs where you buy that one rod, an 844C MBR, you buy that one rod and you can throw half your stuff on it because that tip section loads so easily. It deflects so easily, but when you get into the mid, it stops loading. So if I'm throwing a top water with treble hooks and they eat it, I just gently lean back on them and I'm fighting them on that tip section and it's perfect. But if I'm throwing a spinner bait, and they eat it, I smash them, I load down into that mid and I get into a lot more power and I'm able to bury that great big spinnerbait hook all with the same rod, it's very interesting. Again, that's a rabbit hole. In the video description, we'll link favorite models for a bunch of different things, but I just want you to understand there are some exceptions too. So we've talked about the basics, we've talked about of actions and powers. The most confusing thing is that brand to brand, there's not a standard. It's not like there's some company out there that sets the standard that everybody else has to follow. It doesn't exist. So a rod being rated moderate fast or fast or moderate, it's all relative to the brand. And you will find over time uh, that you'll identify which brands lean one way or the other. And there's not really a quick way to get around that. I can't really help you with that. Well, I guess I can actually. I can tell you right out the gate, your really high-end rods, uh, a G Loomis NRX Plus, a really high-end 
Daiwa, uh, a really high-end Mega Bass. Those rods are just going to lean to fast and extra fast. They have to blend that material with something else to get it more moderate. Um, a rod like a St. Croix, St. Croix's always lean more moderate, always. That's just the materials that they work in. Um, so if you're looking at St. Croix rods and you're worried that it's not going to be moderate enough, maybe you should go a little further. You don't have to. They're always a little more moderate than you think, which is amazing for power fishing. It's amazing for jig fishing. It's amazing for glide baits. They load super deep too. It's great for that, great for cranking. Uh, everybody else that I can think of is at least close to the line. Oh, except maybe Gamakatsu. So Gamakatsu, they're Avenge rods. They are something completely different. It's called a regular action that's not a u.s action like i'm not aware of any u.s rod brand that makes a regular but there are a bunch of jdm companies that use a regular and it's I'm not sure i even know how to explain a regular basically they can do almost anything they appear to be extra fast extra extra fast until you really lay into them and when you really lay into them they load all the way through the mid it's completely different than what you see in us rods uh, but if you get used to it it's awesome it's similar to the mbr uh, in that you can do a lot of things with it so like this rod is incredible for throwing little treble hooks uh, i use this for all my line through swim baits i use it for my small glide baits but again, if I just took this rod and flex it for you, you're like, there's no stinking way that you're throwing tiny treble hooks on that. It's not right. But I just know from having used regular rods, if I pull hard, all of a sudden down here, you're gonna see that thing fold. Very different. So again, if you get into something like a Gamakatsu JDM rod, a JDM imported rod, you're going to see some very very different actions that are really neat. Now with that, I've been long-winded. Let's just look at a bunch of these models and try to interpret the Greek that they write on the side of them, okay? Because it's actually not hard. You can walk into a shop, grab a rod from any brand, flip it over, read the model number, and for the most part, you're going to know exactly what that rod will do. The exception being, if you pick up a Croy, you know it's a little bit more rotter, right? If you pick up a really high-end rod, you know it's a little more crisp, a little faster than you're thinking. But generally, the information on them is very simple. So thir the first one here, this is a 13. This one, the model is, or the number on it is a BO2S71M. Greek, right? Well, BO, blackout, for sure, this is a blackout. So BO, then we've got a 2S. I honestly don't know what the 2 stands for. I don't know on this one. Uh, the S is for spinning, and then it's 7-1-M. Seven foot, one inch, medium. Okay, so blackout, spinning, seven foot one, medium. Super simple. Now you could read that standing in a tackle shop or you can be on Tackle Warehouse looking at a model list and actually understand what that means. Let's run down the line. Here's a Loomis. Now Loomis is different. That one, the 7-1 meant seven foot, one inch. That's what most brands have accepted now, but not everybody. Loomis is one that works in inches. So here we go. This is a G Loomis, the IMX Pro line. The model is 845C CBR. 845C, 84 inch, five power. So the first two numbers, 845, 84 is inches. It's not feet and inches. 84 inches, five power. C stands for casting. CBR, crank bait rod. Couldn't be any easier. As long as you know, it's inches, not feet and inches. Uh, let's just run down the line. This is another Loomis. 
844C MBR, okay? I love those MBRs. 84, 84 inches, so that's seven foot. Four power. Four power is going to be medium heavy. Five power, heavy. But again, that five power in a crankbait rod, if you go and flex it, <laughs> Look how much more moderate it is in comparison. Huge difference. So 844C MBR, 84 inches, four power casting. MBR stands for mag bass rod. Mag bass rods are those rods with that really unique tip section. Most Loomis's are JWR, jig and worm rod. What's next? We're just going to run down a line here because again, the reason why I'm doing this, some people are going to bail at this point and I understand that this isn't important to you, but for the guy who's in a lot of tackle shops or you're really into your gear, understanding what on earth these mean is everything. Okay. Mega bass. This is an interesting one. It's written completely different. F five dash seven, five X X. EMTF, total Greek. Okay, Mega Bass does everything a little bit differently than everybody else. So that first letter, that F, that stands for force. It stands for power. You could replace that with power, but force five. So a five power, heavy rod, dash seven five XX. Seven five is seven foot, five inches, the XX in this case is Orochi, the Orochi XX. So the Orochi XX EMTF is your model, which is the Extreme Mission Type F, just shortened up to EMTF. Very simple, again, once you know what it means, you can interpret any of them. Shimano X Pride EXC 76 MHB. Okay. EX X Pride C casting 76 is seven foot six medium heavy MH. The B is because there was the standard X Pride before they came out with X Pride B, the newest line. So the B represents that this is an X Pride B. You can tell that by the difference in your handle being that monocoque material instead of a traditional grip. Very simple. Let's just keep trucking right down the line. Here's a halo. Halo HFKS II 75 MHC. It's actually not that hard. If we look, this is a halo KS2 Elite. So halo fishing, I'm guessing, HF KS2 75, seven foot five MH moderate, or excuse me, medium heavy casting. Super simple. If that was a 7.2, I'd know this was a 7.2 medium heavy, right? St. Croix, what have we got here? LBTC 7.4 MHM. Legend Bass Tournament casting lbtc that's my guess legend bass tournament casting seven foot four medium heavy that last m moderate right there i can see this in a list that last m tells me moderate action i'm looking at a crankbait rod without looking any further without having to flex it i already know what's going to happen when i do flex it though that is a crankbait rod extremely moderate and I'll bet the power glass cranker. That's the actual model. So again, I'm able to know so much about the rod just by reading the code on it. All right, we've got a Daiwa here. STA GS 681 LFB. Another mouthful. Steez, so that's going to be our ST, Steez AGS, which is the guide train. So ST Steez AGS guides, 
six, eight, one. It's gonna be six foot eight, one. I assume that that one is a, is a power rating uh, because then I'm followed by an L, so light. F, fast. B, I, I honestly don't know what the B means. Maybe it's a second generation of a Steez or something like that. But I know right out the gate exactly what the model is. The important thing is that six foot eight, one power, incredibly light rod. You're talking BFS type rod, right? But notice, extra fast to fast. You don't see it coming down in here, right? High end rod, high end materials, tend to be extra fast to fast. You don't really see them come below that unless it's blended. All right, I'll try and fly through these last three. Another Loomis, this is a JWR, NRX Plus 854C JWR. So NRX Plus, 85 inches, four power casting. JWR is that jig and worm rod that I talked about. This is a Savage Gear, a Black Ops. B O F S 610 M L B O black ops. The F I don't know. I don't know what that is. Maybe black ops fishing. I, I don't know. The S of course is spinning. I see that by my first guide, that big stripper guide 610. So six foot, 10 inch M L medium light. I know right out the gate, great finesse. Spinning reel, medium light. I'm gonna be throwing a Ned rig, maybe drop shotting, uh, just throwing that little stuff. Cashin. Cashin rods are another one that really leans to the moderate end of the spectrum. Uh, similar to Croy, they just, they use completely different materials. They build in-house just like St. Croix does. Uh, very, see just how moderate that is? and it just flexes way down through that rod. They're, that's just the way they build their rods. That's another one that you just know coming out the gate. So that model, IBFS7LF. The I, I'm gonna guess is Icon, BFS, bait finesse system, seven foot light. So 7LF, seven foot light, fast action. But again, if you took this fast action and compared it to another brand's fast action, this one, just because of who makes it, will tend to be more moderate. Just got a couple more. Here's another 13 fishing. This is a Meta or Meta rod. Uh, that's the one that they did with old G-Man. Well, it doesn't get easier than this. There is no, there literally is no code. It just says straight up seven foot four, medium heavy, fast, three eighths to one ounce. Well, that's about as convenient as it gets. No code whatsoever. Nice work. That's easy 13, thank you. Denali. This one says worm and jig, N3744WJ. Denali. N3, ah, okay. It's the N3 series, N3, 744WJ. So we're going seven foot four, four power, WJ, it said right there, worm and jig. So they've designed that to be their worm and jig rod. And again, one other thing that's interesting, this is a four power that they're calling a heavy. Other brands will call a five power heavy. There's a, again, there's not a standard. So there's a little bit of wiggle room in there. Most brands of four is a medium heavy, but it just, it varies. Here comes a Dobbins for you. MK735C, MK Maverick. That's this series of rods. Maverick 735C, seven foot three, five power casting. And then last but not least, we already took a look at that guy right there. That's that Gamakatsu rod, the Gamakatsu Avenge. But let's see how they rate that. Where is it? B70MH-R. I don't know what the B means. I have no idea. 
but the 707 foot MH medium heavy dash R and R is that regular action that we talked about that you'll see in some JDM rods. Again, this is obviously a rabbit hole, right? We could go on for another two hours. We haven't said one word about differences in reels, differences in quality and sensitivity of different materials, but this can be as simple as, hey, you're the new guy? Grab a seven foot medium spinning rod and go fishing. If you find that that's not enough, it's time to advance to a bait caster. Get you a seven foot medium heavy, put some braid on it and call it a day. For the guy that's on a budget, hey, get a rod that's a little longer, lean back on that thing, watch that tip and you're gonna be okay. But for the guy who's investing three, four, five, six, seven hundred plus dollars in a rod, you need to know the exact differences. Why is that one a drop shot rod? That one a Ned Rig rod? Why is that one okay for a jerk bait? Why is that one okay for a square bill? Those are those fine differences that I wanted to make sure you understand. Obviously this was way down deep in this rabbit hole. If you guys have questions, if this created more questions than answers for you, let me know that in the comment section. If you have specific questions, ask them. I'll do everything I can to help you. But we wanted to do this in depth because I want you guys to be able to look online, walk into your local shop and don't be that guy that glazes over. Be that guy who's like, hey, I need a rod to throw a 4.8 Kitec on a jig head. And you can walk into a tackle shop, look for the price range you're after, go down the sides of them, hey, 7.3, medium, heavy, this is gonna work for me. I want you to be able to buy with confidence so that you're not wasting money and buying the wrong things. But again, in the video description, we'll link just by technique, some of our personal favorites to help you as well. If you guys enjoyed the video, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and we'll talk to you soon.